Thank you for joining us today on Etfal. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. Around the world, cities are evolving at an unprecedented pace, grappling with profound challenges driven by urbanization, demographics, and climate change. City leaders face extraordinary pressures to manage this growth and implement sustainable development strategies. SDG 11 calls for inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable cities and signals the importance of cities in advancing sustainable development. Africa is the world's most rapidly urbanizing region. By 2050, more than 1 billion people will live in cities across the continent, while Nigeria is said to be the Africa's urban growth giant, with almost 100 million people in over 780 of its cities. And this has produced so many challenges. Today we look at how we can turn informal settlement into livable communities in the country. We start right here in Lagos. Do stay with us. Daily, tens of thousands of people arrive in Lagos, contributing to the increase in the city's population. Now put at 21 million at independence in 1960, Lagos had an estimated population of 763,000. Today, it is struggling to live up to its megacity status. And behind these evident everyday challenges, we see a range of more long-term risks like climate change and the impact of air pollution on health, uncertain economic development and rising inequality. They all call into question the current pathways to greater prosperity and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. I, I don't believe there's any government that uh, probably wants to deliberately uh, inflict pain on the citizens. I get you mean. There could be one or two omissions somewhere uh, in planning or, or communication with the people on the potential impact. Uh, when you are building anything, you want to build a road, there's going to be impact, uh, negative impact on the people uh, and uh, there are the mitigating factors that will have been built into the process. But we need to be able to communicate uh, with the people so well uh, and I think uh, maybe that's a missing link. But uh, one thing I know is that uh, I'm sure all the basic things, the basic factors must have been built in into projects and uh, all we need to do is to communicate with the beneficiaries. While Lagos is by far the largest city in Nigeria, security concerns, rural poverty and hopes for greater economic opportunity are driving people to cities all over the country. In the decade between 2007 and 2017, Nigeria's urban dwellers increased from 41% of the population to about 50%. That is, one in two people in Nigeria lives in a city. But much of this urbanization is unplanned and chaotic. Currently, over 48 million people in Nigeria live in slums and the number is rising. We are very glad to see the interest in uh, addressing urban development and climate change issues coming together finally. This is something we have been talking about for nearly 10 years, uh, where we began the discussion of African water cities, uh, which is really looking at the convergence of issues of climate change and uh, rapid urbanization and development uh, across African cities. And COP26 really offers this opportunity to, uh, for people, governments, and private sector to really look at what we're doing. And we hope that what we are doing inspires the rest of the world and uh, particularly African leaders to uh, learn to develop their cities uh, with, with issues of climate uh, very much at the heart. Nigerian architect Kunle Adeyemi leads Africa Water Cities Project. His organization works to develop an improved type of architecture and urbanism for water settlements in Africa coastal cities, starting with Makoko. Makoko um, happens to be one of the largest uh, water communities and water developments, uh, I would argue, on, in the world, um, uh, particularly as a 
a, a, a poor community that has very minimal infrastructure. And it occurred to me 10 years ago that Makoko was both a challenge but also an opportunity uh, to think about, the, uh, to be insightful about what our cities, the future cities could look like. So it's, al it's always been a place where we looked at what people were doing already, learned from the environment, and also looked at how we can improve the challenges. So Makoko, I think, is very pivotal in being a place that we can use as a pilot in demonstrating the potential of improving our water communities, uh, both in Lagos and also across the Niger Delta, and then scale this up into many African cities and communities. On the 7th of June 2016, the Makoko floating school structure collapsed due to deterioration resulting from a lack of proper maintenance and collective management. We have been working with the community of Makoko very closely and we have engaged them uh, to understand what they want, to understand their main uh, uh, key resolutions. And those key resolutions include they want to remain on water, that's very, very important. They want to remain in Makoko as a place because this is part of their community and their, their heritage, and they want it to be affordable. So our solution provides all of these things. It is a place, it's a, uh, water cities and African water cities and the uh, potential uh, uh, the, the, the development of Makoko allows us to integrate most of the community within the area, if not all, hopefully we can, and, and also still uh, densify the community to allow others to be part of it in a much more improved environment where you have infrastructure for waste, water, sanitation, uh, power, uh, security, environment, and create beautiful buildings and create, you know, uh, uh, sustainable buildings that are, uh, you know, not livable not only for the people of Makoko but for you and I. Makoko has challenges, but experts say his inhabitants have found solutions to the problems of overpriced land, the housing shortage and frequent flooding, creating opportunities for agriculture, industry and trade. Kule believes when the state government and the people work together, something positive will come out of Makoko. Well, I, I am hoping with the current administration led by uh, 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 His Excellency Governor uh, Songo Olu, that this is actually the time, after 10 years of really talking back and forth, that he takes the step and takes the leadership to allow this change and allow this movement uh, to even begin in this community. Because the community is ready, you know, the government is, the there's a political will, you know, and we know by having conversations with the Ministry of Physical Planning and LASURA, and they are very supportive. So with this mandate from the governor, we believe in the, the next year, we'll begin to see incredible change in Makoko going forward. Neglect and sometimes nonchalant attitudes of many Nigerians towards many projects across many cities in the country have been the challenge disrupting sustainable development. It has a highly vulnerable coastal state with a growing population with more than the state's 21 million residents living in informal settlement, which renders them highly vulnerable to the impact of climate change. The Lagos State Government undertook a climate risk assessment which revealed that Lagos's population and economy are most at risk of flooding. The government says a vulnerability assessment showed that an estimated 65% of the residents of Lagos are extremely poor and therefore highly vulnerable to climate impacts. It further identified close to 7,000 infrastructure assets, buildings and other features that are vulnerable to climate change. The majority of these, over 6,500 with a value of more than 73 billion naira, were classified as highly vulnerable. The state government then developed a greenhouse gas emissions inventory for the year 2015, based on the GPC protocol for cities. It showed that in 2015, Lagos State generated emissions of more than 26 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent or 1.3 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per capita. We focus on emissions 
because from the World Bank Air Quality Monitoring Project we just concluded, it was found out in a project called source apportionment. That is where is the greatest pollution coming from. And surprisingly or not surprisingly, it pointed to traffic in Lagos. In industrial nations like this, it, it is usually from industries, manufacturing, air travel, not from cars. And I would explain a little why it is pointing towards traffic. The kind of fuel we use, in developed countries the sulfur content has been reduced. Lagos State and the federal government are working on that with DPR to find a way to reduce that. Also, the governor recently commissioned an electronic car. But before we get there, we have to think of what is realistic, what is affordable, what is available. So we are encouraging hybriding now. Lagos State BRT buses will very soon all be running on gas and that reduces carbon footprints by a significant margin in Lagos State. These this, um, interventions we're planning are measurable when we have air quality monitoring machines. It will tell us before this, this were your emissions and after this, this is your emissions. And what are we doing as a regulatory agency? The truth is, a lot of people do not understand what causes um, global warming or climate change. We are very, very passionate about information, education and communication, two-way discussion, not just talking at people. And we believe that achieving net zero is possible. We cannot but emits. It's part of life, it's part of organization, industries have to come up. But we're looking for a framework where what you emit is um, mopped up by other things. For example, as simple as planting trees, Last Park is an agency in Lagos State that ensures that all setbacks are green. Why are we saying this? Because trees are natural carbon sinks. They help us mop up the carbon monoxide from the air. And you will notice that in terms of greening and parks and beautification, this current administration is taking it very seriously. It's not just for beauty, it's towards carbon sinking. In 2018, Lagos State signed up to the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group's deadline 2020 and committed to developing a climate action plan. Aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, with the ultimate goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, it also has a second five-year climate action plan for 2020 to 2025. Though implementation of the actions in this climate action plan will significantly reduce Lagos State's emissions while building its resilience and contributing to the well-being and prosperity of its population that are not yet sufficient to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Another thing we are looking at is looking for partnerships for finance in climate change, climate financing, green bonds. And in coming to COP26, we have been able to talk with the Commonwealth, at least Lagos State's Ministry of Environment has been able to talk to the Commonwealth. And we have a project coming up which in a couple of weeks we would initiate where they would help us access finance into sustainable and bankable projects of the government. This exercise coming here has been a very rewarding and eye-opening opportunity. The whole world has gone green. We are conference of parties. Nigeria is a party and it's about time we started thinking green. And with all we have seen here, with all we have heard here, I believe if there's political will at the federal level as we have at the state level, we're marching slowly but steadily towards net zero. At COP26 in Glasgow, 
Lagos was one of the cities the United Kingdom government promised to support in their transit to net zero by 2050. This commitment was made at the cities, regions and built environment day at the conference. UK as COP26 presidency called on cities and regions across the world to commit to net zero emissions by 2050 and the decarbonizing of the world's urban buildings, which are responsible for around 40% of global emissions, crucial in combating climate change. Back to with 27.5 million of new UK government funding as part of the UK's international climate finance commitment. The program will support cities across Africa, Asia and Latin America to take action to tackle climate change and create a sustainable future by helping them to become carbon neutral by 2050 and prepare low carbon infrastructure projects. In 2019, there were seven cities with a population of 1 million or more, 80 with a population ranging between 100,000 and 1 million, and 248 with a population between 10,000 and 100,000. But much of this urbanization is unplanned and chaotic. We have a huge housing shortage and especially a shortage of affordable housing. So if you say this community or that community are an eyesore, you're not recognizing the fact that no matter what it looks like, it's someone's home. It's where someone's living. And they're living there because there isn't someplace else. So if you simply try to destroy that place, without providing any kind of alternative, without discussing with them how do we improve the conditions, all you're doing is undermining the human development and the capacity of those people to thrive and survive in the city. So what we need to do is stop looking at, um, at problems as problems, but understanding what are the causes of those problems. If it's an affordable housing shortage, if it's a shortage of viable economic opportunities in the formal sector, how do we work with the solutions that people are putting up themselves and turn them into something that fits within the vision of the city that, that we all share, which is a city, of, a city that's you know, resilient, sustainable, inclusive. Currently, over 48 million people in Nigeria live in slums and the number is rising. According to a World Bank report about African cities, cities on the continent feel crowded precisely because they are not dense with economic activity, infrastructure or housing, and commercial structures. The group says the cities lack formal housing in reach of jobs and without transport systems to connect people living farther away, forcing residents to forego services and amenities to live in cramped quarters near their work. The realities of life in Nigeria's cities are hard. In Lagos, about two of every three people live in a slum. Less than 10% of residents have access to piped water, forcing urban householders to purchase water from vendors at up to three times the normal price charged by the state government. Only 6% of urban households have a flushing toilet that is connected to a sewage system. The attraction of Lagos is the economic empowerment, the promise of, of um, economic empowerment that Lagos you know, gives to people. So for instance, the Lagos state government has a what you could call a sustainable development strategy. It calls it the FAMES. So it has six pillars. Um, it hopes to focus on traffic management and transportation, hopes to focus on issues on health and environment, the, um, the um, um, entertainment and industry and what have you. And all of this is with, with the aim of making Lagos a smart city. So smart governance. So I think for a lot of the other states as well, they, they, there has to be um, a, a you know, reshaping of governance. It's quite important to identify what the sustainable development strategy is for each of the states. And for the, so for the states to actually identify that these are my key priority areas, um, to make, you know, to ensure that there are infrastructures and just to make the quality of life better for, this, for the people living in that state. Many cities in Nigeria, like Lagos,
struggle after decades of underinvestment. Swaths of green areas reserved in Abuja to beautify and give it an eco-friendly ambience have been left to wither and in some cases have become dump sites and places for open defecation. From Benin to Port Harcourt, Kano to Ibadan and all the major cities across the country is the same story. Water taps run dry. Electricity, a luxury that does not exist, a mounting heap of refuse. But these cities also have the opportunity to learn from mistakes in creating centralized, large-scale public works. Every uh, high-income settlement that is slum growing up somewhere around the area, all right, because the people that will service the high-income area, low-density, um, they're low-income people. And now, trans except where you have uh, cheap, affordable transportation, uh, they want to hang around those areas. So they create uh, a belt just around uh, the high income area. For every high income area, there's a slum growing up somewhere around. Uh, so many cases abounds in Lagos I can give. And also, uh, Ogun State is already having such problems. Uh, you see high income locations, and you start seeing people servicing those high income areas, living in those uncontrolled areas. All right, so for every serial city or uh, city management, you have to manage uh, both the high income end and the, uh, and the slums. Slums have to be managed. Slums have to be properly organized so that uh, you don't have, uh, you don't transfer problems, inherited problems from the slum, and you don't bring it up there. So uh, there is no way you eradicate slum. They will always be there. And they, hang, they are never too far away from the high income end. So you plan it and you have to manage it. But Nigeria is not the only country in the world that has a rapid urbanization problem. Informal settlements house almost one billion people around the world. The world is becoming increasingly urbanized. Since 2007, more than half of the world's population has been living in cities, and that share is projected to rise to 60% by 2030. Cities and metropolitan areas are powerhouses of economic growth, contributing about 60% of global GDP. However, they also account for about 70% of global carbon emissions and over 60% of resource use. Rapid urbanization is resulting in a growing number of slum dwellers, inadequate and overburdened infrastructure and services, worsening air pollution and unplanned urban sprawl. To respond to these challenges, 150 countries have developed national urban plans, with almost half of them in the implementation phase, ensuring that those plans are well executed will help cities grow in a more sustainable and inclusive manner. And also one of the key um, important points is the issue of public participation, grassroots grassroots participation as well. It's quite important for governance. Um, one of the so one of the issues that we tend to overlook in Nigeria is the importance of the local government. So whatever government does, there has to be a top-down approach and also a bottom-up approach. Experts recognize that environmental deterioration is not inevitable. Although many cities are suffering severe environmental and economic damage, it is not an inescapable outcome of growth. Mounting evidence from cities around the world show that the fundamental challenge has to do with urban governance, better planning and effective management of urban development activities and the human environment. We've seen research that's been done comparing India, China, and Nigeria on issues of urbanization. And the reality is that in Nigeria, natural population growth is a bigger contributor than migration as compared to those other countries. On our side, what we're doing is working together with communities to find the solutions that we can tackle at our level 
Um, but we know that communities and civil society can only do so much if we don't have the government supporting and working together with us. So even if the government is not ready to lead, the government could partner with us to try to find lasting solutions to the various issues. If it's an issue around you know, urban planning and, um, and uh, informal settlements, we have very strong concrete examples of in situ upgrading that's a better alternative to forced eviction. If there's issues around security, let's work on community policing initiatives that can actually work. If it's issues around climate change, we have so many projects ongoing to try to um, mitigate um, and adapt to climate change impacts that are likely you know, coming down the pike. Um, what we need is stronger partnership from the government to make those things work well, to make sure that the policies aren't undermining community efforts and civil society efforts, and then to help take them to scale. Because once we've done something well in a few communities, we have a huge network. We're working in 144 informal settlements across Lagos, 60 in Port Harcourt. So we can take innovations to scale. We can start taking this to the level where we'll have a citywide and societal impact. But that's where we need the government partnership. And we also need a government that's committed to helping positive development rather than undermining community and civil society efforts. <laughs> Nigeria is projected to have almost a billion people by the year 2100. And with more UNICEFs, Asabes and Emekas coming in, Lagos could become the world's largest metropolis, home to up to 85 or even 100 million people by that time. Experts say there is no easy solution and no quick fix. In the meantime, turning the makeshift and informal settlements into livable and sustainable communities across the country is the greatest challenge of our time. The world's population is constantly increasing to accommodate everyone. We've been told to build modern, sustainable cities that evolve ensuring security, improving infrastructure, and creating strong links between informal and formal cities. As the experts say, for all of us to survive and prosper, we need new, intelligent urban planning that creates safe, affordable, and resilient cities with green and culturally inspiring living conditions. I'm Ayola Kasim, asking you to join us next week for another episode of Earth File. In the meantime, do check our page on YouTube, youtube.com slash channelsweb. Do click the playlist tab and then click Earth File. From all of us here in Lagos, it's bye for now.